Warning, the podcast you're about to hear has a unique conservative perspective and may be politically incorrect, containing some controversy in its message. This episode may speak out against liberalism, socialism, the dark state, and religious organizations. It is possible that evil in politics, education, law, society, and religion will be discussed and exposed. However, we believe this podcast adds truth and value to a mature, disenfranchised audience who may be tired of apostate religions and wicked world systems. Listeners who are easily offended, overly sensitive, or have progressive leanings sympathetic to the topics we expose should be forewarned not to listen any further. We thank both those who choose to listen as well as those who choose not to listen. You've been warned. And now, let us get on with the show. All right, it's Brother Kapow here, Freedom Friday Hour. Today's date is the very scary and frightening Friday the 13th, September, Friday the 13th. And it feels very dark and gloomy out there, and it feels like if there is any bad luck, you know, it's bound to find me. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry for the, the negativity there, but uh, yeah. Anyway, I'm just saying it feels that way. I'm not saying it is, but it's Friday the 13th, and um, some people are very paranoid about that and very suspicious. Normally, we don't care. I still don't care. You know, I live down here on this rock, and it's surrounded by demons and disembodied spirits, wicked spirits, earth spirits, uh, you name it, evil spirits, all under the command of Mastima, Satan, Lucifer, whatever you want to call them. It's a it's a spiritual principle, and they're organized into principalities, powers and rulers of wickedness in the high places. Up there in the air, second heaven, floating around, whatever they do. But they operate, and they really they operate with impunity until the day of judgment. What that means to you and I is that Oh, they do whatever they want, whenever they want, however they want. And uh, it's just by the grace of God that we can keep them away or keep them at bay or overcome in times of overwhelming by them. And uh, there are times that it's a little more difficult than other times. Uh, Times it seems a little bit easier. Other times it's a little more difficult. And um, But anyway, they're running around, and they're just all around. They're looking for any chink in the armor, any crack, any way to get in, disrupt your life, take your joy, ruin your faith, mess up your trust, your hope, make you hopeless, make you doubt God, make you doubt Scripture, make you doubt your doctrine. Um, They especially attack your faith. Because faith only works when something's not seen. I truly, I truly believe that's a biblical principle. Because if you can see, if you can see what you're believing in, then it's not faith. Because you believe it because you see it. You know what I mean? It's, um, it's when you can't see it. You can't see that result. Like if you're waiting for a healing or uh, financial, um, you know, relief physical relief, mental relief, spiritual relief. You know, you're waiting for these things and you can't see it because you're constantly bombarded by demons, Satan. Then that's where faith kicks in because you ha- you have to believe it, you know, without seeing it. So the principle is you'll see it when you believe it. That's the biblical principle. When you when you when you believe it, Regardless of the circumstances, that's when you will then see it. So if you're being bombarded physically or mentally or spiritually and you're looking for God to relieve you of that, even though he's not and it's here, the principle is that if you believe that he is and you hang on to that faith, that eventually what you're believing in, you will then see and that thing will then uh, go away. Um in the reality we live in, the non-biblical principle is that <clears throat> you have, you believe in whatever you see, so or feel, or are experiencing. So, if you're experiencing the physical pain, the mental pain, the spiritual pain, then um, 
that's what you believe you have. And so if someone says, well, God's going to heal you or God's going to deliver you, you say, well, that's great, fine and dandy. But for right now, this is what I'm feeling. So I'm not healed or delivered. So it's hard to reach beyond the the reality of what you're experiencing to a non-reality. Now, the Bible says in Hebrews, you know, that uh, you can't please God without faith. So that makes it even harder. So it's like pouring gasoline on the fire. So you, you have all this stuff around you that won't go away and you can't deal with it. But you're supposed to deal. You're supposed to look beyond it in faith that God's going to take care of it even when he's not at the time. But then you have a scripture that says, well, you can't please God without faith. So then it's like you're already screwed up, but now because you can't exercise a faith, now you're really screwed up because you can't please God. <laughs> you know what I mean? And so, well, you know, Abraham pleased God because, you know, not seeing, you know, not seeing he believed in the promise and yet he was old and his body was old and Sarah's body was old, but the promise of the seed coming through him and, you know, um, you know, city not built with hands. He's a sojourner down here and everything. And then in Hebrews 11, it goes through a lot of uh, the biblical stories of people that uh, exercise their faith. And so they're on, um, they're the cloud of witnesses, right? So such a great cloud of witnesses is what it says uh, to us. You know, they're, it's for us to, to look at and go, well, they can do it. You know, we can do it, you know, and then you got, the, you got, you know, and I love this, you know, I got, you got the three Hebrew, uh, you know, slaves taken to Babylon and they won't bow down. They won't bow down to the image of the king, you know, because they're, they, they got faith in Yahweh. They believe they serve Yahweh. That's their God. And they're not going to serve any other God. They're not have any other God before them. So they have that kind of that kind of faith. He says, "Well, you know, if you if you don't bow down, you're going to be thrown into the, you know, the fire, you know, uh, or Daniel in the lion's den, you know. But you know, the the, the three were thrown in the fire. Um, and and I love this because they say, you know, our God is able to deliver us." We, we have no doubt. We have faith that he's able to do this. Uh, we see it. We believe it without even seeing it. We don't see his deliverance yet because you're about to th throw us into this fire <laughs> made seven times hotter than regular fire, right? This furnace. So we don't see the deliverance yet, but we believe he's going to deliver us. But then they say this, but even if he don't, he's able to, but even if he don't, we're still not going to bow down to your image. And I just love that. I'm going, wow, you know, these these guys had these guys had huevos that were the size of a truck, man. That's unbelievable, you know. We we believe God can rescue us, but even if he don't, we're still not going to bow down. And I know a lot of us think, oh, you know, I gotta have faith like that. But I, you know, I don't I don't think that's that easy. Um I'm not saying it's a supernatural thing, you know, I don't know, maybe it's a character thing. Um I don't think that's that's something that comes that easy. Or else it wouldn't be such a great story. Daniel was the same thing. Throwing the lion's den, uh, you know, for not serve, serving other gods. And the mouth of the lions were shut. So, but I think a lot of times people are thrown into a den or thrown into the fire and they are consumed. Uh, I think the stories of Daniel and his three buddies there in the Bible and Hebrews 11 and they're the great cloud of witnesses and faith. I think those are those are great narratives and those are great things that God did and, and they are faith builders. Uh, but there are times and a lot of times when people are thrown into the fire or thrown to the lions and then they are consumed and they are not saved. Now at the end, uh, they have eternal life and that's that's the goal. So their faith has to carry them beyond what they see here in this life. And that's that's a whole different you know type of of deal for those who survive that and watch their loved ones get martyred or died or whatever, persecuted uh, for the faith. And so, having having said that, you know it's kind of kind of gloomy, you know, for uh, Freedom Friday. I know, but the the first the first story that I want to talk about, and it's it's a very solemn, serious thing that really, really bothers me. The headlines on Fox News was mega church pastor 
Jared Wilson, known for his mental health advocacy, dies by suicide. And that um, that's bothersome. Yeah, uh, I lived in Riverside for for years. I worked for the Riverside Police Department for eighteen years. I used to go to uh, Greg Laurie's Harvest Church um, sometimes on a daily basis to eat lunch and run around the bookstore and look at the books and the Bibles and things like that. Um, when a police officer would die. They um, often would have the services at Greg Laurie's Harvest Church. I'm, I'm well aware of Harvest. I don't know Jared Wilson. He was he was an under pastor, obviously one of the under pastors. But nonetheless, he's from Harvest Church. It is a mega church, uh, Greg Laurie's church. And um, this young man is in his 30s. Was in his 30s. And uh, this is, it's it's just horrible. It, it's horrible because. Well, this, this is a reality. See, this isn't one of those beautiful Rad Shack, Me Shack, and Abendigo stories. And it's not one of those beautiful Daniel and the Lion's Den stories. This is like Brother Kapow in 19, you know, 2019 story. This is like this is like the real life story that like I see. Okay. So this is like uh, you know. Well, here's 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 the story. So you 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 gotta de- you gotta determine determine what I'm trying to say here about faith. Um, the mega church pastor in Southern California, known for his mental health advocacy, he died by suicide last Monday. Uh, hold on, <sighs> this, this breaks my heart. Sorry. He had been, he'd been a pastor with the Harvest Christian Fellowship Church. For about 18 months. And uh, in 2016, he found an anthem of hope. It was a Christian organization meant to amplify hope for those struggling with mental health and substance use issues. And he was 30 years old. And he uh, he was very open about his battle with depression. He also, he often spoke about his struggles online and in his work as a pastor. Um, one time he wrote, loving Jesus doesn't always cure suicidal thoughts. He wrote on Twitter shortly before his death. But that doesn't mean Jesus doesn't offer us companionship and comfort. On social media, family and colleagues mourned his death. His, his wife said, I love you forever, Thomas Jared Wilson. But I have to say that you being gone has completely ripped my heart out of my chest. Uh, Suicide doesn't get the last word. I won't let it. Uh, He survived by two sons, Finch and Denham. I don't know how old they they are. Now, Greg Laurie, who's the senior pastor at the Harvest Mega Church, described Wilson in a statement as a vibrant person always serving and helping others. And he says, it's with the deepest sadness of heart that I found out that my good friend, Jared Wilson, went home to be with the Lord last night. Jared was not just a brother in the Lord, but... a dear trusted friend in Christ. And then he says, uh, he says, so we have a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul. And he quotes, you know, he puts Hebrew 6, 19. And uh, Lori said, sometimes people may think that as pastors or spiritual leaders, we are somehow above the pain and struggles of everyday people. Uh, we're the ones who are supposed to have all the answers, but we don't, do not. Sunday marked the beginning of National Suicide Prevention Week, a week-long campaign meant to bring awareness to the warning signs of suicide and teach people about the resources available for people in crisis. And then, uh, you know, they they do a national suicide hotline and everything. 
And of course, the media jumped, you know, jumped on this. Uh, so it's hard to reconcile, you know. Um, I didn't know this young man. I can only imagine his pain um, and what, what he was going through. You know, trying to uh, trying to do the right thing. Okay, you, uh, regardless, you know, he, with Harvest, he's a pastor with the mega church. All the all the all the negative stuff I always say about big churches and. You know, money and what they do. I mean, regardless, all those things I say, regardless, here was a human being who, who, you know, at the heart of it was was trying to do the best thing he knew how to do within his religion, within his faith. And, um, you know, found, founded the Anthem for Hope. And he wanted to amplify hope for those struggling with mental health and substance use issues. So he had been there. And um, obviously felt that his experience could bring, um, you know, hope to those who, who may be struggling with these things. And uh, so so to have, um, you know, a young man like this, um, a Christian young man, uh, take his own life, um, it... it it goes beyond my doctrine. It goes beyond my theology. It goes beyond what I know as faith or hope. And, um, you know, I love reading those stories, you know, about Daniel, three boys, Abraham, all of them had such faith. Uh, but what about this guy? <clears throat> you know, let's, let's write about Jared. Let's talk about him. Did he have faith? Didn't he, what happened to him? You know, how, how do we deal with this as, as Christians, as believing Christians that have faith in the word of God and, and hope and you're putting everything there and you're doing everything you, you can do and you're, you're standing against Satan and you're battling and, and, you're, and you're, you're doing everything you can and, you know, you've, you know, you've read Demons in My Marriage Bed a True Story of Spiritual Warfare by Paul and Linda. And man, it's helped you a lot. And you've learned all their techniques and you got it down. And you're fighting for everything you can. And you've memorized, you know, Ephesians 6.10 and you've put on the whole armor of God. And Paul says, once you know, once you put everything on and you've done everything to stand, you stand and you fight. You know, well, what about, what about this guy? What about Jared? Let's 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 do an epistle for Jared. Let's talk about him. What happened there? So it breaks my heart. I would ask you to, if you're a believer, I know uh, most listening to the show are some are not. If you are a believer, that you would pray for Jared's family, his wife, his two kids really for that whole church, Greg Glory, for for everybody, uh, everybody that his ministry touched influence because now, um, you know, those people that he, he helped and gave hope to, you know, where, where they're, we are, where are they at? You know what I'm saying? Where are they at? Now it's easy to dismiss it. Well, Satan got to him. Satan destroyed him. Satan gave him the lie. Satan, blah, blah, blah. It's, well, it's easy. We can, we can blame Satan all day long because it is ultimately rooted in evil. But the fact is, is it happened, shouldn't have happened, but it did happen and it does happen. And there's probably more people out there than you can realize uh, that are like this young man. Um, is it Satan overcoming the saints? You know, I don't know. Like what's what written in the book of Revelation. It talks about the dragon, you know, chasing the, the offspring of the women. And... Uh, He's given power, you know, over all the nations and every tongue. He's got all this power, Satan, dragon. 
This is uh, he's given power. He, he over he overcomes the saints. I mean, I've looked at that. It's like, what does that mean? Overwhelm, you know, Nike victory. It's like, but I got victory in Jesus. The, the same the same book in Revelation talks about. Well, who are these people in the white robes? Who are they? Well, you tell me. Who are they? And I'll tell you. You know, they're they they're the, those who overcame. They overcame. Uh, through the blood of the lamb and through their testimony and, and, and made their, their garments white. Well, they overcame, so that means they made it. They made it out. They made it out. Uh, so they overcame because they made it out, and that's good. That's what we want to do. But I guess that's no guarantee that you're, you're not going to be overcome here. You know, I, I don't know. I have, I have a hard time reconciling how, how you, you could be overcome here by Satan. Satan can overcome you as a Christian here, but yet you can still make it out and be an overcomer in Christ at, at, a, at another time or after death. You know, um, obviously I need to, to, to look at that a little more uh, because it's in, it's in the same it's in the same writings, the same books I have I have where Satan is overcoming the saints. And then I have um, another part where saints have overcome by the blood of the lamb and the word of the testimony. Um, so maybe Satan overcomes them like, like he did Jared. But then Jared ultimately overcomes because he, um, he dies even by his own hand, but nonetheless he dies and now he's with the father. I mean, I, I don't know. You know, when I, when, I wrote, when I wrote the book of the wisdom of death years ago, after the death of my father and my father-in-law within three months of each other, I mean, I went... I went through an incredible mental journey in trying to reconcile my father's death because I had had a lot of experience with death as a police officer. I mean, people had died in my my arms. I I've held young men with their brains in my hands, literally. I've I've held uh, people where paramedics ripped their chest open, stuck their hands in, and then physically uh, massaged their heart to try to get beating again. Uh, I've been to numerous fatality crashes, suicides. I can't tell you how many suicides I've handled. And, um, you know, been alone with the corpse, reading the suicide notes, seeing the dried tears on their faces. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. And watching their children come home. Yeah. Discovering, you know, their mother dead. I've seen a lot of stuff, but when my own father died, it was it rocked my world, and it was really, really hard to reconcile. And um, you now, yeah, granted, I wasn't a oh, well, I had a biblical biblical degree at the time and stuff, but I wasn't what you would I wasn't what I am now. I wouldn't I wasn't I was in a backslid condition, you know, very new agey and things like that. But when I wrote the book, that's why I don't talk about it a whole lot, but. Um, it helped a lot of people. The, the book has helped a lot of people because um, even though it's kind of new agey, it, it discusses on how to deal. It's called Six Paths to Understanding Loss and Grief. It's how to understand this stuff. And it's not a clinical book. It's, it's about experience and going through the grief process, you know, and how to deal with it. Um, you know, and, and I remember when I, when I wrote that book, uh, and then I, I was doing s- some seminars, grief you know, uh, bereavement seminars. And I was, did several at this, this one church, um, Calvary Community Church in Himen at the time. And it was like, the question came up to me, well, what happens if a Christian commits suicide? Do they go to heaven? You know, well, as far as I know, taking your own life is not the ultimate sin of, um, you know, it's not an unpardonable sin of blasphemy. What's like, it's like, well, that was your last sin. You can ask forgiveness. Boom. I mean, I don't know how that works, but I just can't see, you know, do I believe that a Christian should be so broken, so distraught, so beat up that he has, you know, no other way out but to take his own life? Do I believe that should be? Of course not. I don't believe it does. You should be that, get to that point. And I think some would argue, well, if he was really trusting in God and really had faith, and I mean, he would never have gotten to that point. But I, I call BS on that because it's it's just simply not true. I mean, Satan uh, can attack people uh, physically, mentally, spiritually. I mean, it, it relentlessly, hour after hour, day after day after day, relentlessly. And you can pray and pray and pray, and you get no hope. You get no relief. You get no those the prayers aren't working for whatever reason. 
Um, you're not being protected for, for whatever reason. And, and you can go through all this stuff. And I think a person can get to the point where they just don't have any, they don't feel like they have any way out, you know, and it, that's a shame. And they can't, you know, it's like, it's like you can't even go to a church nowadays. You know, this young man, I mean, here he is at Harvest. He has a senior pastor. He's surrounded by a bunch of people. He's surrounded by a bunch of Christians, people. Think about it. He has access to Greg Laurie, who's written, I don't know how many books, hundreds of books. He's a well-known pastor and evangelist. Greg Laurie uh, lost his son, uh, you know, not too many years ago. He lost his son in a collision there in Corona, California. I remember that well. Uh, so you, you have access, and then as an underpastor, it's a big church. And he had he he had he had peers. He had peers. He had churches all around him. He had his own ministries. He had his wife. He had friends, and yet th this is the path he chose. And that wasn't a decision he made, you know, flippantly. I guess what I'm trying to say is, it's, a, it's, it's, it's serious. It's, it's a really, really serious battle, really, really serious, you know, times in which we live. And, um, you know, I, I don't know. I, I don't have the answer to that. But if, if you are a believer, please pray for peace, uh, everybody involved and, and that's all I got to say about that but it, it, it just breaks my heart and I know it's a little different for Freedom Friday but it just uh, just I had to talk about it uh, the next story is uh, a little different Benny Hinn I, I, I pray I hope this is true what I mean that it's true in his heart Benny Hinn says I'm done with it uh, for decades, Benny Hinn has been conducting healing services. He preaches the prosperity gospel. This guy's worth about $60 million. That's not including his uh, ministry-owned houses and planes and yachts and boats. He's got a lot of money. And um, I don't know. He does all these these healing things on TV. You know, he waves his coat around and people fall into his spirit. And uh, I'm not here to talk about that, how that works. I don't know. But he... Um, He's made a lot of money preaching prosperity gospel. I've seen him on uh, TBN many, many times <coughs> as a, um, a fundraiser. And he was a fantastic fundraiser. And uh, that's why they loved him and had him on there because he knew how to make a lot, a lot of money from, you know, uh, people who were beguiled that were ignorant in these things. Uh, one Christian apologist calls an amazing theological turn a well-known televangelist who's been criticized for preaching the prosperity gospel has taken a fresh look at the Bible and now is correcting his theology. So I'm not going to bag too much on him, even though, you know, I did write on the Facebook post, you know, <laughs> you know, as soon as he starts returning all the money to everybody, like Zach, Zacharias or whatever, Zacchaeus, uh, you know, maybe you kind of believe it a little more. But, you know, let's hope this is true for his sake. Um. Hen used to say, he'd make these kind of appeals. He would say, help me pay the amount of money, and I believe in God with you, that whatever seed you sow, God will bless you back. One million times, the harvest will come to you so quickly with power and with speed, you can go to BennyHen.org and sow your seed, and let's see this miracle together. Now, you know, that's totally untrue. It's a ripoff. That's not how, you know, you manipulate the power of God to get money. So it must have been quite a shock to his viewers, many of whom perhaps have supported his ministry for years by sending him money to hear him say earlier this week. Here's what he said. He says, I'm sorry to say that prosperity has gone a little crazy and I'm correcting my own theology. And I will tell you now something that is going to shock you. I think it's an offense to the Lord. It's an offense to say, give $1,000. I think it's an offense to the Holy Spirit to place a price on the gospel. I'm done with it. I will never again ask you to give $1,000 or whatever amount because I think the Holy Ghost is just fed up with it. Now, I'm telling you, I, I, I hope that's true. When you read the you know, hundred or so comments on this, most people don't believe it's true. Most people, because he's been such a 
clever manipulator in the past. They believe he's just lying again and it's another gimmick and whatever. And some people are hopeful that it's true. Um, one guy says, well, he can join the rest of us in authentic Christianity with earthly poverty, struggles, trials, tribulations, and eternal hope that comes with truly knowing Jesus Christ as our Savior. And I have to have to agree with that guy because it's not um, it's not an easy it's not an easy path, and it's not a rich, wealthy path either. But uh, let's let's hope that Biddy is uh, Biddy is sincere, and uh, you know maybe maybe we can gain gain the brother back. You know, who knows. Let's see, the college fix says go for woke. Children's publisher promotes bisexuality, political activism, and school affairs. It's what our world has become. Could she really be crushing on both boys and girls? Huh. It's a national publisher of children's books has refocused its marketing on a hot new trend, diversity. And diversity now means gayness and lesbianness and transgenderness. That's what diversity now means. It used to just mean you know, racial diversity. Yeah, Scholastic on schools, you know, they, they're gearing up for back-to-school presentations with book fair, fairs and things like that. So the publishers team up with the nonprofit coalition that promotes diverse books. Sounds good, right? And it's uh, for the Scholastic Book Fair. It shows the publisher taking a hard turn towards literature that highlights issues of sexual identity intersectionality, whatever that is, and social justice. Uh, here, for example, instead of, of introducing children to Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet, Scholastic promotes the book Star-Crossed. It's a bisexual version of the play. It centers around a female character who plays Romeo in a middle school play and ends up falling in love with the also female Juliet. And the catalog ponders, referring to a middle school student, could she really be crushing on both boys and girls? Another scholastic promoted book features a girl who realizes her dad is secretly dating her best friend's mom, both of whom are divorced. And it talks about uh, political correct storylines. One features a Pakistani-American girl whose mosque is vandalized by a hate crime. And uh, another introduces children to Native American heroes, including political activists. Um, they talk about Syrian refugees and blah, blah, blah. It's a whole bit. It's the kind of uh, literature that needs to have its own sections in libraries and bookstores, especially in children's sections. Uh, Scholastic's nonprofit partner called We Need Diverse Books is keen to fill this role. Its mission is to push for essential changes in the publishing industry. So uh, there is peer pressure to make boys act like girls. Apparently, the target audience includes the elementary and middle school age group. This is reflected in Scholastic's advertising for its upcoming book fair cycle. The publisher's interest in integrating LGBTQ plus literature into middle school libraries goes back at least a year when top teaching blogger John D. Pasquale gave a roadmap for schools to create inclusive affirming schools for LGBTQ students. So there you have it. <clears throat> That's what they want to do. That's what they're doing. That's what they're going to do. And there's nothing you're going to do about it, okay? So I just read you to the story so that you're aware of how you're being overtaken and overcome by satanic forces. And then you can um, do with it what you will. This next story is about a cyborg magician. Uh, it's a man that kind of try to look like a, a female, but it's just an ugly dude. It explains why it implanted 26 microchips and magnets in its body. Why this story is important is because the next story talks about Silicon Valley's frontier for mobile payments. They want to get into your body. They want to enter inside of it like a demon. Las Vegas Biohacker Conference Convened here the other day, um, this one person got on stage and uh, pulled out a big giant needle, twisted it deep and deep into its left forearm as the music from Frank Sinatra, I Got You Under My Skin, played on. And then she, uh, or it finished its routine, capped off by loud applause. 
And she sat down for a fireside chat about her work as a cyborg magician. So what uh, this person does is under her skin, she has all these implants and um, magnets and stuff like that she uses for her uh, magic show. So she's mixing the occult, uh, Luciferian and satanic worship with, you know, that's what magic is, with this technology of body implantation. Do with it what you will. Uh, she says that she's by the end of the week, she's going to have up to 35 implants in her. And she does all kinds of stuff with them. But she performs magic tricks. And the article is just kind of praising it. And let's talk about what we're doing and how neat that is. Right? Well, the very next article is Silicon Valley's final frontier for mobile payments, the neoliberal takeover of the human body. That's why the former one is important. Because you have articles saying, hey... She's a magician. Um, it's cool. She has all these implants. How neat this is. But here's here's a story talking about ditching credit cards for facial recognition removes the last physical barrier between our bodies and corporate America. So companies are refining biometric services and they're doing it little by little uh, like they always do. Uh, they say, you know, as payments move from cash to credit cards to smartphones, financial technology companies known as fintechs have been honing their biometric services. They're infiltrating every aspect of our digital lives. Let's see. They will authenticate $2 trillion in in-store and remote mobile payment transactions in 2023, 17 times more than an estimated 124 billion of last year. So it's moving quite fast. They're uh, using biometrics as a method of payment. It's going to be pretty popular in the future, they say. Uh, it's propelled by the globalization of commerce and the fact that companies in the U.S. will want to find new ways to facilitate cross border transactions. And then, of course, here's the bottom line. Frictionless payments lead to more spending. That's what it's all about. It'll make shopping easier for consumers. And if studies on mobile payments provide a barometer, so your study's been on this, more lucrative for companies. Now, here's a study that was carried out by researchers at the University of Illinois. And they found the number of actual purchases increased by almost one quarter when people used Alipay mobile payments. And I can tell you why, because it's not real money. You're not seeing anything exchanged. You know, you know, you don't have to dig in your wallet and take out that hard-earned 20, you know, for something. You just swipe your phone and boom, you got it. It's like a credit card. It's just plastic. They know this. This is what it's about. It's it's slave ownership. It's you know, this is this is not God language, this is total devil language. Uh, using a mobile wallet made people likely to spend more on food, entertainment, and travel. So you'll spend money whether you have it or not. Uh, in dollar terms, people using mobile payments spend an average 2.4% more than those who did not use them. One theory, if we don't handle direct credit cards or cash, we don't consider a transaction's consequences. Isn't that something? Don't consider the consequences. I think that says everything right there, that word. Uh, people, now check this out. People use Amazon's Echo smart speaker. Anybody have um, Alexa or Amazon's Echo in their house? And you're going, play me Dwight Yoakam, guitars and Cadillacs. You doing that? I wish you the best of luck having that demon in your house listening to you. Good luck. People who use Amazon's Echo smart speaker spend 66% more on average on the online retailer than other consumers. <laughs> That's a survey done by Amazon themselves. People who have the money to buy smart speakers may also have more to spend, they say, but check that out. 66% more on average when people use the speakers. You know why? Because they don't have to type anything in. You don't have to hit that send button. You don't have to put that credit card info, right? It's easy. It's easy. Uh, facial recognition, widely used. It goes on and on. Uh, neoliberal take over the human body. Every technological necessity exists in the real world and is used commercially, they say. It is just hasn't been integrated into one biometric payment method yet because it would creep people out. 
<laughs> That's what this uh, this dude is saying, who is uh, Silicon Valley's expert on it. It would creep people out. It's the neoliberal takeover of the human body. He says it already exists, but it hasn't been rolled out as a complete biometric payment method yet because it's creepy. <laughs> It's a guy named uh, Sinreich. Sinreich said this. The Federal Trade Commission has taken action against a variety of fintech companies. Um, they want to, you know, important consumer, you know, protection. It's it's out of control. There's nothing. They, they can't keep up with this stuff. Apple and Samsung have already sold tens of millions of devices enabled with fingerprint technology. Um, biometric information. If lost or stolen fingerprints, can't change like a password. Yeah. Anyway, there's no federal law right now to regulate biometrics. You got to know that. There's no federal law. No will they be because these people own everything. So there you have it. They're going to hack into your body. They're going to do all kinds of neat stuff. One last story, and this is for the way things ought to be. Thank you, Juan Montero, for handing me this uh, story at the last minute because I could not find anything decent in the news. It's uh, teen football players make Bully Boys Day with selfless gift and friendship. It's from the Godfather Politics. So it's not even mainstream media at godfatherpolitics.com. It's the kind of stuff that Juan reads and studies on a daily basis. And that's why he is such a learned man when it comes to these Illuminati Jesuit priest pieces of poop. The antagonism between the jocks and the bullied loners is an old story, but two football players in Memphis, Tennessee just made the lie to the old saw that their story will leave you with a lump in your throat. Now, I think this is also a biracial thing because I think the football players are black teens and the guy that was bullied that they helped was a white teen. Uh, even though they don't say that, the pitcher tends to indicate that, which makes the story even better that it crossed these racial uh, falsehoods. A teenager was bullied because his family was too poor to buy new clothes, was approached by a pair of his school's football players. The boy froze in fear, but when the players revealed what they were there to talk to him about, the boy ended up shocked and immensely grateful. A cell phone caught the moment when two football players approached the bully teen to apologize for kids who laughed at him for constantly wearing the same clothing to school, but they also took the next step by handing the boy some new clothes and a pair of new sneakers. You know, we were in the same third period, said Martin Luther King Jr. College Prep High School football player Christopher Graham. I want to apologize for laughing at you, and I want to give you something to make it up. Graham and his football teammate, Antoine Garrett, then presented their gift to freshman Michael Todd right there in the school's hallway. I've been, he said, Todd said, I've been bullied my entire life. I don't really have clothes at home. My mom can't buy clothes for me because I'm growing too fast. Uh, young Mr. Graham added, when I saw people laugh at him and bullying him, I felt like I needed to do something. Todd said I was very happy, shocked completely. Instead, after the video went viral, the news team at Fox 13 reported, uh, or oh, indeed, indeed, after the video went viral, Fox 13 reported that donations are now being taken for the teen and the Burra family, and that's good. Um... So that's a good story. That's a good thing. And like, yeah, you see the picture there and the two football players are black teens and the uh, the bullied boy that was helped is a, is a white teen. And so it breaks the racial stuff and it breaks all the nasty lies and, and all the junk they're trying to do to us. So that's, uh, that's how it ought to be. This is the way things should be. All right. So having said that, um, take heed, stay alert. Satan's all around, abounding. You know, I don't know if the, the bottomless pit has been opened up. I have no idea. I don't, you know, I, I mean, I've been it, so I, I don't, I don't, I don't understand the book of Revelation in the sense of timelines and when things happened and did they already happen? Are they going to happen? Did they occur? You know, I don't know. I, I don't, you know, I'm, I'm not, I'm not boastful and arrogant enough to sit here and lie to you and say, you know, I get that. So when I say things about revelation, I don't know if it happened, it did happen, when it's going to happen, if it's true, allegory, I have no idea. You know, it, it escapes me, but 
You know, there's a part there where the uh, you know, angel comes to the key to the bottomless pit, opens it up, smoke comes out like a locust. You know, all the demon hordes. You know, is that what we're living in today? I don't know. It just seems, you know, like this young, you know, pastor, this young man killing himself. I mean, what, you know, we've had that in the past, I know. But, I mean, p- people are just really hammered today. We're hammered. We're hammered unbelievable. We've been hammered for the last four months in ways that you, you would not believe. Um, <laughs> and I don't feel like writing another book about it because I just think it's too late. But uh, it is, it's so labor intensive, and I just not I'm not going to do it. But uh, just incredible stuff. You you have no idea uh, what's been happening to us over here since uh, May first. Just unbelievable, um, unbelievable attacks. So uh, that's where we're at, and. Um, I probably depressed you enough. <laughs> if you were happy and joyous, I just took it from you. Anyway, I apologize for that. Go your way. <laughs> Be happy. Skip. Skip around. Don't forget to listen to our friends uh, Matt and Shy Jacks on the their podcast called the uh, Seed War Radio. They can be found on Podbean and other places. I, uh, I listen to them on Podbean. Podbean. It's called the Seed War Radio. They're teaching good stuff, and um, yeah, and they also have the Fourth Man Barbecue, where Matt is the consummate expert on low and slow cooking on the on the smoker, and he has invented several meat rubs too, and they're delicious. Uh, the Mesquite Cafe. Named after the famous blues band right here in Mesquite, Nevada. Mesquite Cafe. If you don't know anything about Mesquite Cafe, go to the Facebook page, Mesquite Cafe, and educate yourself. Anyway, he did this this meat rub called Mesquite Cafe. I love it. And uh, in fact, last night, we put it on some chicken, and we baked it on chicken. And I can't really, I'm not lying to you, man. This stuff was delicious. It's not salty. It doesn't have all the sodium that you get in the store. It doesn't, it's just savory and, and and robust and it just brings out all the flavor, man. I mean, the blend is incredible. And there's another one called GPS and I think it stands for garlic, pepper, salt, I believe. And uh, it, and it's smooth. I haven't tried that one on chicken yet, um, but I'm sure it's just as good. I tried it on hamburger and I tried Mesquite Cafe on hamburger and the other one hamburger and just fantastic. But the chicken, the chicken just came out. Unbelievable! All we did is put the rub on it and put it in the, and, and then baked it in the oven. We didn't barbecue. I don't do low, slow, and all this stuff. I, I'm an idiot. I'm just I throw a burger on a grill with you know propane. You know I'm 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 one of those idiot guys. You know I don't have any talent in that area, but Matt does, so he knows what he's doing. Um, so anyway, I encourage you. They're on Facebook called the Fourth Man Barbecue. The Fourth Man Barbecue. You can also get a hold of them at the. Fourth and four is the numeral four. The the numeral four T H man B B Q. Okay, let me spell out to you T H E four numeral four T H M A N B B Q. The fourth man barbecue at gmail.com. So look them up on Facebook, join the group. There's about 101 people now in this barbecue group, organically. Just people wanting to know about barbecue and watch him cook and he does these live shows and videos and stuff. You're gonna get hungry and you're not gonna know how to get it, but nonetheless, it's good for you. Maybe you'll lose weight because you can't eat it, but it feels like you did. Who knows? That's how I'm trying to work it. And... Uh, and you can get a hold of them at gmail.com, fourth, the fourth man barbecue, gmail.com, and you can order the rubs from them. They take PayPal. You can order from uh, uh, face, I mean, Facebook. Yeah, just get a hold of them. They sell the rubs. They're 16 ounce jars, so they're huge. They're not the little teeny jars. They're 16 ounces full of this rub for $5. I know. I feel like telling them, Matt, Shy, come on, you need to charge at least double that. You're not gonna can't make any money for five, but they're trying, they're only charging five bucks plus shipping, and then they use a flat rate shipping. So, anyway, I'd highly recommend it. So, 
you know, while you're listening to this depressing show, you're going to be barbecuing some good food, putting some rub on it, and make you feel better. All right. So good night. We'll uh, talk to you later. Bye-bye. Recently, spiritual attacks on innocent people have increased considerably. This is partly due to society's transformation into a satanic cult. Most people are clueless or hopeless in combating this spiritual mayhem. We wish to offer two good books to overcome these attacks. First, Demons in My Marriage Bed, a true story of spiritual warfare, offers one of the most effective training systems in combating spiritual darkness in order to gain personal freedom. Second, Eyes to See Unseen Enemies teaches how to see the hidden dangers which are all around us, even in places we would least expect them. Both books can be purchased on Amazon.com as a paperback or ebook. It is our desire that you will take advantage of these opportunities to increase your effectiveness in spiritual warfare and learn how to fight back instead of being a victim. We'll see you on the battlefield.